I just want to welcome everybody. My name is Simon Levinson. I, um, along with my colleague Allison Wusher, are co-founders of the Drawing Foundation, an uh, organization dedicated to all things drawing and works on paper. And part of our mission is to help host uh, in-person and online events, such as this one, uh, the Association of Print Scholars 2024 Distinguished Scholar Lecture. We're very pleased to be here. Um, if you'd like to learn more about us, you can find us at thedrawingfoundation.org. Um, but it's my pleasure to now introduce Cabell Ahn, the Vice President of the Association of Print Scholars. Thank you, Simon. Um... I'm the Vice President of the Association of Print Scholars, and I wanted to say a couple words about our organization. Founded in 2014, we're a nonprofit organization that supports innovative approaches to the history and practice of printmaking. Our membership of over 550 members includes curators, artists, students, librarians, archivists, and independent scholars, and any print lovers worldwide. And our membership is open to anyone whose work focuses on printmaking, and we hope to, and we strive to support the latest developments in the field by sponsoring a wide, wide range of events, workshops, and awards. And part of our yearly programming is the Distinguished Scholar Lecture, and we are beyond thrilled to be able to share the work of our speakers with you today. And with that, I'll turn it over to Galina, our president. Thank you so much, Cabell. It is my immense pleasure to introduce today's speakers on behalf of the Association of Print Scholars. Neil Ambrose Smith, descendant of the confederated uh, Salish and Kootenai Nation of Montana, is a contemporary Native American painter, sculptor, printmaker, and professor. He has taught at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and has led many workshops nationally, numerous of which alongside his mother, jean C. Smith. He has developed an app called Artist Ideas with 100 ideas for making art available for Android and Apple. And his work can be found in many national and international institutions, including the New York Public Library, the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian, Galerie Municipale d'Art Contemporain in uh, Chamalier, France, um, and others. He received his BA from the University of Northern Colorado and MFA from the University of New Mexico. Jean Quixtesi Smith is an enrolled Salish member of the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Nation, Montana. Smith received an Associate of Arts degree at Olympic College and in Bremerton, Washington, a BA in Art Education from Framingham State College, uh, Massachusetts, and an MA in Visual Arts from the University of Mexico. Since the 1970s, um, Jean Quixtesi Smith has been creating complex abstract paintings and prints. Combining appropriated imagery from commercial slogans and signage, art history, and personal narratives, she forges an intimate visual language to convey her insistent sociopolitical commentary with astounding clout. Smith's work carries tremendous weight and yet feels light and conversational, in large part due to this forged personal lexicon of developed imagery. As critic Garrett Henry once wrote, Quote, for all the primal nature of her origins, Smith adeptly takes on contemporary American society in her paintings, drawings, and prints, looking at things native and national through bifocals of the old and the new, the sacred and the profane, the divine and the witty. Over her very long career, Smith has received numerous awards, and among them, the Academy of Arts and Letters Purchase Award, the Joan Mitchell Foundation Painters Grant, the Women's Caucus for the Arts Lifetime Achievement Award, the College Art Association Women's Award, New Mexico Governor's Award for Excellence in the Arts, election to the National Academy of Art, Living Artists of Distinction Award from the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum, the Woodson Foundation Lifetime Achievement Award, and if that wasn't enough, um, four honorary doctorates um, from Minneapolis College of Art and Design, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, Massachusetts College of Art, and the University of New Mexico, Albuquerque. Smith's work has held, is held in numerous collections, including Museum of Modern Art, uh, Quito, Ecuador, the Walker Art Center, Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Museum of Modern Art, Brooklyn Museum, Metropolitan Museum of Art, 
and the Whitney Museum of American Art, which last year mounted a major retrospective, Jean Quick to see Smith memory map that has since traveled to the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth and just last week opened in Seattle Art Museum. In their lecture today, Jean and Neil will share their experience and history of 30 years of exploration in solvent-free printmaking and environmentally friendly printing practices. Please join me in welcoming Jean and Neil. Thank you so much. Thank you, Galena. Thank you so much. Um, you know, when you ask me to do a lecture about my printmaking, um, often we Native people uh, make connections to other things. And so in doing this, um, I thought that I would like to uh, incorporate a larger community than just myself, um, include my son, but also the many people in in our journey on non-solvent printmaking that we've encountered or taken classes from. And so we wanted to offer today um, mention of those people and their importance in our life and the work that we do. And let me uh, say one other thing before we continue. And that is the uh, field of monoprinting um, is, um, I believe, a way to uh, reach communities who want or need an art experience. And so I've been on this journey for all these years uh, doing monoprint workshops with teachers and uh, people in drug abuse programs and homeless and um, uh, you, um, children. So many different kinds of people. I've been willing to do um, monoprint workshops. Sometimes it's been difficult because we haven't had the right uh, press to use. Uh, but Neil and I um, scurried around and uh, made alternative ways of working. And so we've worked for many museums, including the George O'Keefe in Santa Fe, uh, um, but we've gone into museums and done workshops uh, all over the country and for uh, our ed conferences all over the country. Um, because um, some people really have never had an art experience. They talk about art, they teach art, um, uh, you know, they're engaged with it in other ways, but they've never actually had an art experience. And so like I've taken boards of directors of museums and done these workshops with them uh, to give them an art experience. And monoprinting um, is, I, I hate to say this, but I call it InstiArt because it means that we can have a plate and some non-toxic ink and no one needs to know how to draw, you know, just smearing some ink on a plate and rolling it through the press and seeing what comes out the other end is always a woohoo surprise. It's a really uh, wonderful experience to see the look on children's faces and on adults' faces. So now I'm gonna uh, turn it over to my son. <laughs> Thank you for having us. We're, we're really uh, glad to be here and to share our stories and experiences. Um, I'd have to say that the, uh, non-toxic printmaking wasn't exactly where I, in my journey um, in art making, um, directly sought out. Um, but I think it's because whatever was available, um, that's what I made art with. And I, I owe that largely to uh, Jean and her practice and spending so many years with her um, in her studio and as a child, you know, being raised in this environment. Um, afforded the idea that you just make art with whatever's around you. And so my printmaking experience early on, I took two classes um, in 1989 at the university um, in Colorado. And uh, the only thing I came away with was kind of monotype. I didn't know how to set the pressure on the press. Um, I think I knew I had to wet the paper. I don't know. And I didn't know what ink I was using, I had no idea about that. But it, my my understanding and experience was really limited. I was more of a oil painter at the time and I drew, um, I'm a mark maker, but um, 
so taking that experience and then making the journey back home and spending time with Jean and and through that period Jean had been printing all over the United States at how many at least 15 that I can think of 15 pro shops right mm -hmm. yeah. um and so and and her experience she didn't take printmaking you you didn't have any printmaking classes in college either no no so um uh, March Devon invited her in into mm -hmm. Tamarind in like 78 something like that 79 yes yeah in that time yeah um and Jean was like oh I don't I don't know how to make a print or something and and Marge was like no problem just come in and we'll help you and that started Jean's journey in uh printmaking and that was directly lithography then but as she traveled around the United States she had these experiences of like uh, etching and calligraph and sheen clay and mm -hmm. Um, and then monotype. Mm -hmm. And so when I got out of school and we got together, um, printmaking was still in the background, but it wasn't really until you got the Mitchell Award, which was... Um, 1996. 96. Yes. And the first thing Jean did with that money was, I'm buying a press. Yes. And most artists kind of stick to their lane. Um in in a certain genre and usually that's from uh, university training you're supposed to stay in your lane if you're a painter you're a painter if you're a sculptor you're a sculptor but you you know you're not a printmaker kind of thing and so um we were both of the understanding and belief uh that art history um is is gives us license and permission to do whatever it is that we're going to do and so historically every artist uh worth their salt printed you know everybody made prints and so Jean was like we're gonna make prints and we get this press and she starts this path of finding some ink and I think you landed Createx yes a children's ink yeah. that I found in maybe Blick catalog or something uh that was supposed to be safe for children and I didn't want to have solvents in the studio um even though I use a little in, in my paint, it's sealed. And so uh, how to make prints with uh, with an ink that would be safe for me to use in the studio and also be easy to clean up. And so that's where I began my journey. And then as I went to College Art Association, I began finding these ads for Susan Rostow's Akua Color. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is before we had computers. You know, I always find it interesting that, you know, in this journey, there no you internet can, you can set you can segment everything by there wasn't any internet internet yeah. there were no cell phones you were the internet i was the internet <laughs> and so i i was going to college art and going through the the right. college art fairs uh for um materials and and i i was seeing this non-toxic ink and so i asked all around out here all my friends did anybody hear of this did anybody know anything about it and i encouraged uh, Jeff Sippel, who now teaches at University of Missouri and is a non-toxic printmaker, um, I asked him if he'd heard of this ink, and he said no. So then I called Takich and no. And so then I, I begged Marge and Jeff and Bill Lagatuda at Tamarind, could we have a workshop and bring this woman from New York, Susan Rostow? And she came into Tamarind, and it wasn't widely advertised, but there were a group of artists there, and she gave a demo, and I think she had, yeah, she had um like ink yeah. in bottles that was watery, and she would put a few drops. She was an etching person, put a few drops on the plate, and um, and I was like fascinated with this ink, but it wasn't like oil paint for me. Like I need, you know, I'm gonna just gonna use this as an example. Uh, I need something thick and gummy uh, as an oil painter. So I was relating to litho ink and oil painting. And so I I wrote to her um, and I, I begged her, please, could she make an ink that would be for painters? And could it be like in a jar and but be thick, thick? And I could I could use my palette knife and scrape it out and like mix it. I'm, you know, I'm thinking like lithograph. And um, it, it, her mind wasn't there quite yet at that time, but you know what, in time, I just kept pestering her 
and asking her, oh, I really, really want to use your ink, but I, I can't use this little watery drops of stuff. It, it doesn't work for me. And sure enough, she came out with jars bigger than this. Um, and it was a little watery at first, but then, uh, you know, I kept complaining and writing to her and she, uh, she made it thicker and, uh, and it was perfect. And that, that set me on a new path. I mean, that was life-changing and, uh, I could make prints here in my studio. Um, and we, and we, here, and we traveled yeah. with, with that ink yeah. that, that made our job as yeah. educators. Right. So, right, you know, going We've, from one institution yep, to another. Yep, we, that I, I mean, we took off. I mean, we went. I, you know, I would do keynotes for art ed conferences and, uh, you know, museums and I don't know where all. And then I would say, "Would you like a monoprint workshop?" And I'm using non toxic, and there will be no fumes in here. And so, um, you know, I would carry, uh, we would carry Susan's ink with us, or we would have them order it for these workshops, and. Um, it was um, really quite an exciting time to introduce to people a safe ink that uh, that wouldn't harm them, cause allergies uh, or poison them. Pregnant women could be there, and it wouldn't uh, wouldn't harm them. Mm -hmm. An easy cleanup. And here in my studio, um, I could put a cardboard box on my plate and leave it for two months, and come back and take a little scrape and add a little transparent base to it and whip it up. And like, um, if I didn't like the color, I had a scrape jar that my son taught me to use, and I would put it in my scrape jar, and um, have a wonderful black. Have what? Yeah, and get it or grays. Mm -hmm. We could get incredible grays. Right. And so we're we're going to show you some images. Some images right yeah. now of. So the of, the, the first like images when, when are we started. Createx. Yeah. This is where Jean. Yeah learned how to use Createx with her new press. So this right. is 1997, 1998. Right. And these are um, 15 by 12 uh, prints. Yeah. Next. Yeah. It's and, a mother and child. And they're just fabulous. See the child right there. <laughs> Next slide. Wonderful image. Love that. And you can see the fingerprints. Yeah. And you can see the trail of the artist. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. That's a great piece. I love the wind up key and the female figure. Yeah. It's just fabulous in that little shadow shooting across. Yeah. Next slide. So those were all uh, createx. Okay. And by the time we get here, we move into a new realm of discovery and we discovered keith howard yes well i had for uh since 19 1993 i think it was uh i had been seeing ads at college art for um uh pr printmakers workshops at peace river alberta canada now part of our family uh is metis cree from alberta so uh, one i was fascinated with that and two uh, I thought, wow, what is that non-toxic printmaking in Alberta, Canada? I wonder what that's about. And um, I just, I found an old ad uh, in in um, in Googling around of um, summer of 1997, non-toxic printmaking master workshop with Jeffrey Sippel, Keith Howard, Phil Shaw from London, England, and Lane Borstad from Canada. And... I had been reading about Keith Howard um, in Canada um, and his his um, Peace River uh, printmaking workshop. Well, I never got to go to Peace River. Uh, it probably was a, a, probably was mostly men, frankly, uh, <laughs> and uh, and there was probably a lot of beer drinking in the summertime. So um, you know, it probably wouldn't have been uh, great to to be there and hang out with those guys, but. Uh, I saw an ad that Keith Howard was coming to Santa Fe. So I said to my son, hey, I've always wanted to take a class from him. If I pay for the class, will you take it and then teach me? So this is like 2006 now. Okay. Keith Howard uh, is brought into Santa Fe yeah. uh, by Don Messick, yes. who has this uh, uh, making art safely business in Santa Fe, where he brings in artists from all over the world to teach 
clean, safe practices in all types of art making. And so Keith Howard's there. So I I sign up for this workshop. I don't know what it is. I could just I read the thing and it says image on, and it, it it's, that's like I I don't even know what that means. I don't know anything about etching. I don't know anything about lithography. Mm. But I take this class. Mm -hmm. So I show up, and here's this guy bigger than life, full of energy tells his story of surviving cancer give, give, because of printmaking. Get, give a line with his brogue. Oh, I, <laughs> that's a ripper. And, um, and then his friends come through. Ron Procrasso, another yeah. great educator that right. teaches non-toxic printmaking right. in, in Santa Fe. Yep. And um, Catherine Kernan, like yeah. all these printmakers, like we start meeting all these people. And, um, and Dan I, Weldon, Dan Weldon. And Dan Weldon, who... Yeah has been working with his solar plates yep. since the 70s, which yeah. I, is like amazing that nobody, there. it's an incredible tool. I think yep. I think it's one of the most amazing tools right. um, out there. But, um, but we needed this non-toxic ink to go with all this stuff right. that was being discovered. Right. So that, that, you see, the, it's like a culmination, like a perfect storm where all these things were, these people and these things were coming together and it was so exciting because uh, like none of us knew where this was going to go. Right. And there were people in the traditional fields, and I won't mention any names, who were saying to us, eh, that stuff's not going to last. No, it's never going to do the job. No, it's not light fast. And Susan said, oh, yes, it is. And so, uh, so, but we were so interested in the non-toxic and um, the excitement of of this new stuff that was going on in printmaking and that we could use in our own studio. That was the other thing. And Keith, when he talked about it, he talked about the economical um, way of doing printmaking uh, with his whole his whole methodology was if you go to the grocery store, what can you make art with? Yeah, I just love that. What, what yeah. a great. And we just took that with us right. all over the United States when we yeah. would teach. Yeah. So we would I mean, we were like meeting all these artists in this non-toxic realm. And it was a small group because oh, yeah. they were ousted from the rest of the community. Right. But um, it was it was a wonderful, lovely experience to learn from them and then in turn teach what they taught us. And right. we were not innovators. Not we, at all. We, were, we didn't we, invent oh. anything. All we did was take advantage of everything that these guys offered us. Right. And, you know, I was at Smith College making prints there and Dwight Pogue, I met Dwight Pogue there who has this incredible book. I have it, the title Somewhere. of it here, yeah. Alternative Printmaking, it's called. And uh, he, he was another guy who was part of this field. This field stretched all the way to Scotland and Hugh Bryden. Hugh, Hugh Bryden. Bryden. And he used to come here from Scotland and... Um, make prints with us and teach right. here uh, when Keith Howard was here because they were, uh, they, they were, uh, we were all, and there were a couple of guys from England. Um, those guys, I don't know, but the ones that Neil and I dealt with here, Ron Crasso, you know, Dan Weldon, you know, Don Messick, all these guys, we, we took classes with them. Right. And uh, Susan Howard, I mean, Susan Rasta, we would go to New York and we would visit her in New York. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, we were an underground network <clears throat> in printmaking. Um, let's go back to that last slide that we were looking at. So, in in this in this image, um, this is uh, image on. So, this is a, a photopolymer film uh, that Keith Howard pioneered, and um, I, which is the background, which is two colors. And then the foreground is just a holograph, and um, I, and I think again it's it's like we're we're cutting fence with rules and regulations because we're we're combining a uh, holograph with um, you know a photopolymer background which looks like a lithograph. It looks like a photo transfer, uh, but the 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 translation of imagery and the things that we could do uh, so fast were. Uh, simply amazing. This is three color, and <clears throat> it's called the Wild Green Yonder. Uh, it's about Little Miss Muffet on her tuffet, and in this case, it's a rabbit because I'm talking about nature. And you see the spider coming down uh, to Little Miss Muffet, 
and she is sitting on her tuffet right there. And you see a little piece of clouds and sky over here. And when uh, Neil and I did this print together, uh, we uh, we could pull the, the drapes in my bedroom and we had a garbage can. And they were with a light bulb underneath light bulb underneath. We put that under the plate. Right. Yeah. And that's how we exposed the plate. And yeah. <laughs> and, and, and using Keith's um, film. film. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, we're we're Luddites. Yeah, we're Luddites. <laughs> yeah. We, I mean, we were using everything that we knew how to use. And then this is printed in Susan Rostow's ink. ink. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's and, all cool. And and there's no it, there, there were no fumes and there was no off gassing, uh no nothing. Yeah. And um yeah, and and the, and this has been hanging in daylight um in my kitchen for forever and and it hasn't faded at all. Yeah, I, I actually no, I was, her stuff I was is light fast. Pulling up these images. Yeah. Um and uh I and I I have one of my pieces that we're going to see shortly. Uh the the color hasn't changed and I, you know those those pieces were made in 2006 uh 2008 yeah. let's go to the next slide okay oh this is me so in 2004 yeah. jean invites me to do mm -hmm. uh a no, print. 2006 because this is four. Oh, why this is that's not with my press it is oh yeah well i didn't get it until 2000 i mean 1996 no, 97 oh i'm sorry i'm sorry <laughs> sorry about that yeah so it, I'm it, in the wrong decade. She she invites me over to her studio so I could use her press, and yeah. so it, the the background is Akua ink, and then um, I end up doing a, a silk screen for the two images on top, and um, is that a Xerox transfer? Uh, it, it onto a mylar. Yeah, it was two pieces of mylar. Let's go to the next slide. So here, uh, this is 2006, mm -hmm. and. It's uh, image on, mm -hmm. uh, and this is a uh, uh, 40 by 30 um, print. And it's uh, image on uh, coyote. And um, with, you know, Keith's methods of just layering the film. And it, mm -hmm. so it makes these wonderful lines mm -hmm. down the middle of coyote's uh, body. Mm -hmm. And then um, I did a Xerox transfer from a catalog that I found. And that, so I did this in 2006, the catalog, which was photocopies from 1992. Mm -hmm. And somebody had told me, oh, you can only use fresh Xerox copies. Mm -hmm. we, we kept running into all these rules and regulations right. in the printmaking world. And we kept breaking them. <laughs> I mean, yeah. All right. Next slide. And mainly we kept breaking them because just because of economics or this is what we had to work with. Right. So we went ahead and used it anyway. And it worked. And it worked. Yeah. So this is this is my version of Batman going to the powwow in the wrong outfit. And um, it's Tom Scares Easy. And it's image on. So and it's just a blend background with uh, the image on image on over the top. And I just drew onto the film itself. And then exposed it, so I I didn't even like have an exposure unit or anything because this piece is uh, forty. It's a forty by uh, thirty again. Next slide. Now I this is where I start moving into a larger realm. So this is uh, sixty three inches tall and it's forty inches wide or something like that. And it's a mono print. And it's a mono print with image on watercolor, uh, crayon, Caran d'Ache crayon and Xerox transfers. And um, it I, again, I owe a, largely a lot of this rule breaking to Jean because in art making, there are no rules and that's the first rule. And and so I just throw all this stuff in there to to make my work. And, you know, those drips across the top, it's Akua uh, loves to reticulate with alcohol. And so, it, you know, it just makes a fabulous monotype background. And then I've got image on moving in and out down below, which is a spit bite uh, type of process, which is really blows my mind. And then I've got these large kitchen objects uh, in there that are Xerox transfers. And so you could see that they're really big. I, I have a, uh, there are 11 by 17 uh, color Xerox prints that were, I, I pieced them together so I could uh, get those in there. But, you know, you want to put everything in your work, uh, including the kitchen sink. Of course. Um, I, I don't know. Andy Warhol did that too. You know, Adam Weinberg and his wife Lorraine were here just recently 
um, you know, he stepped down from the Whitney, he was the director of the Whitney, and he was uh, in Neil's um, kitchen, and, and and he was looking at these uh, prints and asking Neil, and then Neil was going through all the different parts of what he did in these monoprints, and he was fascinated with them. And I said, wow, that's really cool that Adam would come here and be fascinated with the process yeah it was the process oh he liked the prints that was clear well yeah but yeah. but he was fascinated when you start yeah. talking to him about yeah. this process about all right. this stuff that you put together uh you know in your studio yeah uh uh to make you know to make your art but also to do it safely which is which is a wonder that we've yeah. discovered in the world like people that are really in the world of art yeah. love everything about art they want to talk about it. They mm -hmm. want to eat it for dinner. Mm -hmm. They want to have it for lunch. Yeah. All day long. It's our we drug know. of choice. Art. It is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, um, seeing, the thing about this whole journey that we've been on um, is that we discovered that many of the master printers out there in, in major institutions uh, have developed cancer over time. And I can remember being in a workshop, I won't say where, but watching a uh, master printer pour lithotine on the plate to scrub it down, and I had to run out of the room. I mean, I mean, those were the days. Like, I'm talking, I'm talking about a lethal poison uh, that they used to use, uh, I think, for dry cleaning or something. Um, mm -hmm. Really bad stuff, and uh, I, I can see why these guys would be breathing these fumes. And you know, Monona Russell. Who, so, yeah. uh, who was a, um, uh, what would you say? She was an inspector. She, uh, she top of the list for yeah. environmental hazards in institutions. Uh, yeah. And institutions would bring her in yeah. and she's like, oh boy. Yeah. Oh dear. Yeah. And, and she would try to talk them into creating these vent systems that would come across the ceiling and drop down over the plate. So you could use these toxic chemicals and then, you know, it would be sucked up through the, you know, through the vent system. Yeah. And um, even then, um, a, a lot of these guys and the ones on our list here, we won't say which ones, had suffered uh, cancer and changed their ways and decided, no, that's not for me anymore. Uh, I, 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 I want to be doing this work. And so that, that kind of like pushed the movement or drove it, yeah. I think, in the very beginning. And for me, it was just that I couldn't stand the odors and and they scared me. So, but you want to make art, and I want to make art, and and yeah. So uh, that that's what we did, and we're you know we're still teaching workshops. Neil's teaching one for Don Messick this summer. Yeah, in and Santa Fe, just did a workshop just, for Albuquerque Academy. Yes, monetized. that's true. Yes, fifty and for kids, the students. Yeah, and um, <laughs> in, you know, in forty and, minutes, right? Yeah. And, and we do stuff like that because yeah. uh, uh, we want people to have uh, an experience, an, experience, an yeah. art experience, yeah. because it's always miraculous. And I'll tell you a little story. When um, I went to Goshen, Indiana, I think it is, Goshen Museum. Um, I think it was Goshen Museum. And um, a teaching an all day, all day, hour after hour. They were busing the children in and some were elementary, some were high school. And there was a young man after the class who came to me and said, Ms. Smith, could I talk to you privately? And I said, sure. So we stepped away from his classmates. And now this was only a week after the Columbine shootings. And so, uh, you know, that was on everybody's mind. And the young man said to me, Ms. Smith, this was the best, best day I've had in three months. And he said, I just want to thank you for that. Now, when I say this to you, I can always get tears in my eyes because I don't know if that young man, you know, his parents divorced and his grandmother passed away. He lost his dog. I do not know. All I know is that, you know, he went off to his bus and that he thanked me for that day. I mean, ah, you know, I don't want to say art saves lives, but but there is, you know, there is oh, a thing does. about it. And so, you it know, saved my the life. Seattle Art Museum, which is hosting uh, the Whitney Wet Retrospective right now, wrote to me two days ago. And they heard me say to the docents that 
you know, uh, children are often latchkey kids. You know, they're often one parent or they've got a guardian raising them. And in school, the schools have been rift of art, PE, music, theater, all the arts. So it's all by rote. It's all left brain. And Neil and I feel when we go into a school and do this, we're doing a great service for children to have this experience to express themselves. So our, our art making is not just for ourselves, but we see uh, we we see mono printing with students in the hour that we get with them as, you know, life-saving. Uh, we see it as, you know, experiential, giving these children a respite in the day. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've seen like mm -hmm. almost like, I don't want to say miracles, but it's it's been exciting to see the response that we get, not from everybody, but, you know, here and there, a special thing pops up like the time I was in Missouri or someplace, and there was um, a teacher, I was doing a teacher's workshop. And one of the teachers just had a son who died. Uh, her husband went off to Iraq and um, she was there with one child and she'd been in a new town uh, teaching art ed. She hadn't made any art for herself for a year. And when I did the workshop, she stayed afterwards and helped me clean up and when she gave me a big hug and said that she really needed this, she really needed uh, this day. And that's what we can do with Susan Rostow's ink and monoprinting because we can wash it up with soap or we can put it in a scrape jar and we can make beautiful art with it. And um, easily. Oh, yes. And, and that's the yeah. only way that we've right. been able right. to share the art experience right. with you know with institutions uh, nationwide yeah. it, right. it, it's largely because of yeah this non toxic movement right it, it made it easy yeah. It, yeah yeah and and we're like we're like an underbelly we're like an underground i mean um but i will say that when susan started this and all these ink companies poo pooed her her ink and um her ink was selling in around the world mostly to artists i'm assuming and, um, you know, interestingly, um, it's like electric cars or, um, you know, solar, things like that, that kind of grow and, uh, and get nudged by economics. Here's the interesting thing is because she was selling so much of her ink is that uh, the ink companies started inventing water miscible inks and, uh, and advertising them. Yeah, it, it it really looks like that. In fact, um, uh, looking at when um, some of these companies, Charbonnel and um, uh, um, who else? There was a couple other um, companies making graphic chemicals. Oh, uh, Coleco. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was they were it was similar times that they were making inks uh, like Akua, but um, you know, cool is still a different animal it, it because it drives through absorption and not through evaporation. And most of these other uh, right. inks drive, still drive through evaporation. Right. But um, I think it was the community that was not interested in changing or, you know, using another uh, tool. And, you know. You wouldn't think that the art community and the printmaking would yeah. be uh, rigid. But what we found in our travels is that... Uh, going into yeah. university departments is that you know uh, rather than changing the yeah. ink they're using they'll pay for all these vents to um, clean the air out of the room extra seatbelts yeah <laughs> like extra seatbelts so we can drive faster yeah so um so but we, but we do see change in um well manufacturers you know, want to make money so right and that you know they're they're going to go where the money is and and so if if schools and institutions need something that's uh, uh, equally effective and light fast, but yep. is easy to clean up and manage with kids, they're going to go with that. So let's look at more of your slides. Oh, okay, let's go so to we that. we can talk about those. The next slide is... We're almost out of time, too. Yes. Okay, so um, I started working larger. So I made a series of prints. This one is um, about 10 feet long, wide and uh, 39 inches high. And um, and it it's just a one giant monotype 
uh, from 2017, uh, where I was, uh, I, th I think you can get an idea of, of who my figure is, the Bear King, um, uh, w jumping around in the um, swamp. <laughs> and, um, and But it's a, a riff on uh, Monet's Water Lilies. And um, uh, that, to make a monotype this large with the Akua ink, uh, I I could just play all day and not have to worry about the ink, like uh, skinning on on the plate or something. And so, mm -hmm. spent a lot of time, you know, with reticulation and uh, m moving it around in in order to get this print. And of course, it, it's larger than my press, so I had to attach a print hammock to my press so it would carry the print away from the bearings and all the dirty underbelly and move move it along. Next slide. Uh, then I started taking classes with uh, Jeff Sipple, and this is a waterless litho. And um, many of us are familiar with waterless lithography. Some of us aren't, but I love it. It's so fast and efficient and great to teach with because uh, Jeff found this ink that's an acrylic-based litho ink. And I know it sounds funny, but the manufacturers made it. It wasn't something that the artists were saying, hey, we need something non-toxic or close to non-toxic. The manufacturer made this ink for uh, offset printing. And it's an offset litho ink that it says, the, the advertising on, on the side of the can says, stays out overnight, mm -hmm. meaning you can leave it out. If it sits out, on, it's not going to skin it. You know, it, it's still going to be good yet. the next, it's not going to dry out. So yeah. uh, it's great for uh, education because... You don't have to clean the rollers and the brayers and the plates and things immediately. You you have some time through the process, and and it gives you a wonderful, uh, rich uh, litho ink. Next slide. This is a a collagraph and dry point that's uh, sixty four inches tall and thirty nine inches wide, something like that. And it was a demo I did when I was teaching at Institute of American Indian Arts. And um, of course, I, it took me longer to make the plate than it did to ink it. But since I was using a kua, I inked this giant plate in about three minutes or less because the ink is loose enough to move it around and wipe the plate. You know, I don't have to sit there and, you know, drag a scraper bar across it to get that ink to go into places, you know, or modify the ink for an hour mm -hmm. um, for, for teaching. It was fabulous. And um, and I and I got to make this fabulous fun image, um, and I think that's my last. So Neil, what what would you say uh, in wrapping this up about our journey uh, with uh, uh, with this printmaking, non toxic printmaking um, that we've been doing now for twenty five years? Yeah, twenty five years. Yeah, yeah. Um, for me, it's afforded me to make art in any way possible. Uh, I, I, did, I can move outside the box and not worry about following rules and regulations and, um, and meeting all these educators in this field, mm -hmm. um, like Keith Howard mm -hmm. telling us why, why would you do it that way? Why can't mm -hmm. you do it this way? Yeah. Why can't you go to the grocery store yeah. and find something to make art with, you know, yeah. what's the matter with you? Or Don Messick running these summer workshops, yeah. uh, uh, teaching people from, all over this country in Europe, uh, in his classes, how to make art without, um, you know, without using toxic materials. Right. Um, I mean, this is an ongoing, uh, uh, you could say ongoing vendetta. It's an ongoing mission uh, that we all are on this page. So when we go out to teach a workshop for children, we, we want them to be safe. We want, uh, we want them to be able to make beautiful art uh, and Susan Rostow's ink has afforded us that because it's non-toxic, made with soy base, and on top of that, it's um, it's light fast and uh, um, and the minerals, the the um, it's pure pigment, pure pigment, yep. exactly, exactly. So that we know the prints that we do are equal to, uh, you know, any done in history. Uh, well, they are... our, our prints are in museums, you know, yeah. like many others, but, right. you know, I've got a kua all over the place. Right. Yeah. In, in museums everywhere. Yeah. And probably they don't know that. And 
in, or know know about our method. And um, it's yeah. our secret. Yeah. The only thing uh, is if they were to put their finger on the ink, it might still be a little sticky. Do you think? <laughs> no, um, it's, it, not, it's not. It's not going to be not, sticky? No. Okay. Okay. Well, that's good to know. We're, we're but, safe. Yes. But yeah. But many things have changed in the art world yes. over time. So now we find out that um, it's graphic chemical that that makes uh, pure pigment with burnt plate oil, which is actually linseed uh, that's uh, left over well, from they, processing. They also have a water soluble ink. And mm -hmm. yes, and yeah. so, but you know, but that's litho ink that um, is made with uh, burnt plate oil and pigment. And so that's new. It doesn't have any other chemicals oh, in it. Oh, yeah. like varnishes right, and varnishes dryers and, and dryer cobalt. and all those bad mm -hmm. things. Oh my God. And um yeah, so it, it makes our our art journey uh much safer and hopefully none of none of us will get cancer from making art. And it started raining here. Yeah, <laughs> which is a blessing. As uh yeah. Okay. It's, it's, we're here in the in the desert in our sandbox. We're glad to be here. We are so happy that you invited us today. Yeah. I mean, uh, we we love talking about our our journey with this printmaking methods and uh, it, you know, and sharing a little bit of our art with you. And uh, we we still are underground. We are not, uh, you know, we are not known in the institutions. Uh, we're uh. uh we are, uh, what would you say, a, a, a network across this country in Europe uh, who kind of keep track of one another and yeah. the latest inventions in this field. Yeah. And uh, and we're just happy to grow everybody uh, who works in this field because we feel they're a blessing in our lives. And thank you. You are thank you for letting us talk about this. <laughs> Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing actually all of this and your journeys and your exposure and the reasons and motivators for for working in these um, in, with these kind of inks. It's um, hopefully after this program, more and more people will know about this. And I must admit, um, I can listen to you like Adam um, Weinberg, you know, for dinner and lunch, um, talk about your prints. Um, uh, we are opening the floor to questions, so please feel free to question, uh, type your questions in the chat, and Cabell and I will um, moderate, and actually we've already had some questions for you, so I'm going to just jump right in. Um, there was a question to Neil, can you please share more about what Image On is? Uh, Image On is a photopolymer film that was initially developed to make uh, computer chip uh, plates. So. They, you laminate the uh, the copper plate with this film that's really, really thin and then uh, expose it uh, and then with an image, right, with a, uh, a film. And then you develop it in soda ash based water and it's it's basically a, a inert uh, bath, you know, like a soapy bath. And it and it eats away that film. It's sensitive to it all the way to the copper plate, and then they would etch the plate to make... Um, With the soda ash. And, and didn't we use solar? Did we not take it outside and do something outside? Well, yeah, eventually. But, yeah. Um, you know, Keith Howard and, and a couple of other people like, hey, why can't we use that for copper resist? And so they developed this whole copper resist idea with it. And then finally, Keith is like, why don't we make the film thicker and then you can stick it on anything and then just etch the film instead of using copper because yeah. copper plates are so expensive. Yeah. And what a saving that was. Right. And the film mm -hmm. initially was pretty cheap. It was mm -hmm. like a dollar a square foot, which I thought when I at that time, like in 2006, was incredible. Because like you could pay $60 for a copper plate, copper plate and then screw it up. Oh, yeah. But with the image on film, it's like a dollar. Oh, that's okay. Let's keep going. And then Keith would be like, well, just laminate another layer on there. And that yeah. other layer will just blend and you'll have more of an image. You know, yeah. you're making art, remember? And so uh, Tackage Press sells uh, image on film. Mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. Keith's wife, because uh, uh, Keith had passed away a while back, mm -hmm. uh, his wife still sells the film mm -hmm. um, from upstate Bernice New York. Bernice Cross. Bernice Cross. Mm -hmm. and, um, and she's also part of this community as well. She's part of this community. She's also, she assisted Keith yep. in, in all of his uh, research. Right. And there's a there's a book Chemical on uh, image on film, but yeah. 
it, oh. to learn image on uh it's mm -hmm. great to to take a class with somebody that knows how to use it it, I had that it makes it a lot right easier here. that book right here um i hope that yeah, helps that's okay um we have a question from amy hughes um so Amy would like to thank you first for sharing your experience with non-toxic printmaking, which are very understudied in conservation literature. Um, yes. Amy is a conservator and she is currently researching Aqua Inc. to help develop storage and handling guidelines for prints made with these inks. At the National Gallery, Shelley Langsdale just acquired a few beautiful prints by Catherine Kernan, which motivated oh, this project. Oh, I'm so happy this is big news. <laughs> this is so wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, so Amy would like to ask you both um, if you handle or store your Akua ink prints differently or if you tend to choose a certain type of paper to better absorb the oils and to help them dry. Sometimes I use wax paper that you get at the grocery store. Oh, oh, to put it in between. Mm -hmm. um, it it just depends. It, it, there's 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 many factors. Um, the, the best thing to do is just experiment. Um, and to see like but glassine I, works i i would throw i mean just myself because i'm a, a lowly poor artist i uh, i just throw newsprint in between my prints and they pick up some of the uh soy as it leaches um off if if i because i'm kind of a heavy printer so i use a lot of ink mm -hmm. and um and sometimes it soaks through the paper um but it's ph neutral so it's no big deal no i've had glassine on on uh Aqua prints in here for 30, 20 yeah. years. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, 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 yeah. I have prints in my drawers yeah. that are stacked in newsprint and they're fine. Yeah. Um, I mean, I got to change the newsprint and mm -hmm. put something in there that uh, is probably better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, they've been in there for like in, 20 years. Yeah. And, and I've had glassine in there mm -hmm. that long. Yeah. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Hopefully that was useful, Amy. Um, and yes, very exciting about that acquisition. Um, uh, a, a question which I think kind of builds on the image on film that you were mentioning. There was a question about what kind of material do you use for plates? Um, so initially, we uh, Keith was researched um, available materials, something that was inexpensive and easy to use. And polyethylene terephthalate, PETG, uh, was the primary um, and it was uh, 030 thickness. And at the time it was like $18, uh, 96 by 48 sheet. And they would roll it up and ship it to you. Mm -hmm. And you can cut it with scissors mm -hmm. because it's a thermal plastic. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's relatively, it's flexible and it's soft. So, mm -hmm. um, that made it easy for me to mm -hmm. make my giant prints because I can fold the plate up like this and walk down the narrow aisles. As we know, in every print shop, you can, you have to turn sideways to get around in there because everything is crammed. And so uh, it was really easy. And I could do printmaking by myself um, instead of having like uh, a slew of people like handling each side of the paper or whatever. I could just roll the plate up like that. Can um, you use the other side too? Yeah, you can use the other side. Um, the other yeah. thing is uh, the the uh, cost of PETG today is is higher than it than polycarbonate and polycarbonate does the same thing so you can get polycarbonate for um at 030 and it's about 38 dollars a sheet or something like that or 40 dollars a sheet now yeah sorry i forgot to mute um we have a question from um we have a question on where one can buy these inks tackage press but they're sold everywhere Everybody sells a Kua Speedball. now. Speedball is selling a Kua now. Well, they own it. They own it. Yes, but they, they bought it from from Susan. from Susan, which is great. Right, which and is then, great. Um, but and it's like international. I was looking at Renaissance, mm -hmm. um, which is a wonderful outfit um, mm -hmm. that I used to run into that guy and his family because his whole family would show up, and it was he ran it mm -hmm. out of his garage mm -hmm. um, at printmaking conferences, mm -hmm. and and I'd be like, oh, I want this roller, and I'll take that one over there, and and then his mom would be like. Give him a discount because he's buying all this stuff. And he's like, oh, okay. He sells a Kua now, you know? Yes. I mean, everybody <laughs> sells it. You can yeah. you can get it, you, you know, it, it's yeah. ubiquitous. And it's the amazing. print departments don't know this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully they will. A-K-U-A. A-K-U-A. If you just yeah. Google that, a Kua yeah. Inc. Yeah. 
it's it'll and it, and we Jerry's don't need stock in the company. We we just love the ink. Amazon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and I uh, just want to say that we've had a, a lot a lot of people saying how they've enjoyed the talk. Um, Laura Einstein um, and Tatiana Reynosa said that they've learned so much. Okay. Um, and Rosalind Goldman said that Keith Howard uh, was just at Rochester Institute um, of Technology teaching exactly what <laughs> what you sharing um, here today. Yeah. Um, and remember, there's Dwight Pogue's book uh, and uh, Jeff Sippel is writing a book on alternative methods. Uh, that, you know, making a lithograph on a piece of wood or something, I mean. Mocolito. Yeah, Mocolito, oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so we're, we're excited yeah. and waiting to hear. And Catherine Kernan has a new book on uh, monoprinting, which also uses Akua and non-toxic methods. Mm -hmm. We don't have a lot. We we can just name, yeah, the, these right now. Yeah. But there will be more. I mean, it's a it's a growing movement. Let's stay say. tuned. Green, it's <laughs> green, a growing green movement. Yeah. Um, if I can ask you to a question, um, you earlier you had that quote about you know going to the grocery store and like seeing what you can make art with. Um, yeah. Did you ever experiment with food inks or you know using um, comestibles to um, yeah generate a type of an ink? Yeah. yeah. In fact, in fact, they were doing that in 97 um, in this advertisement for uh, the Peace River workshop. And the one of the classes that they had um, was in, in uh, uh, called Grow Your Own Inks. And um, let's see. Oh, they talked about perfect dot meal. We didn't talk about that. Um, and and oh, how how to grow your own ink garden, and uh, that was a workshop that they had, and you'll see that from time to time, uh, you know, if not at Don Messick's, but maybe with Catherine Catherine Kernan, mm -hmm. uh, maybe with Dwight Polk, yeah. yeah, because there's a lot of interest in that. Mm -hmm. Oh, we uh, April Volmer, mm -hmm. oh yeah, oh, yeah, she yeah she's she's the woodcut mm -hmm. master, uh, who's using non toxic too, and she uses a cool, and she also uses. Uh, dye in paste uh, mm -hmm. that's just uh, a, a wheat paste, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, April Vollmer, and she has a book out too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, we're trying to think of all these people that we need to tell everybody about because you know, it helps everybody be more knowledgeable. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and this is wonderful. Thank you so much for your generosity in sharing that. Um, there is another question, which I think is wonderful. Um, it was a comment and a question um, by June. Um, I think a lot of the resistance to new materials and processes comes from a fetishization um, of the history of printmaking of the European tradition, mm -hmm. um, that one is using the same kinds of inks, same processes as Rembrandt and Dora, et cetera. Yes. And um, he's saying that he would love to hear you both talk about how you feel about this history of printmaking. Um, he knows you reference Goya and Monet and other old masters, quote unquote, um, in your works, but materially, how do they figure into your practices? Well, the, you know, that that's the, what, what they would call classical, um, the academy or, you know, um, you, you, what's the other, other thing that the canon, canon, the canon. Okay. You put all those words together and what it meant was. Uh, white people's art coming from Europe to teach us how to make art. Mm -hmm. And of course, we native people feel like we were making art before they came here. So, um, uh, you know, that was what we had to learn in school. We every everything that we learned in school was all European. Uh, and um, uh, so uh, that that was what we cut our teeth on. Mm -hmm. That is what we, you know, and then when we got out into the world, uh, to make our own art, you know, we uh, native people uh, spent a lot of time, uh, you know, in our our groups together, going to museums and talking about what we saw. So we could see a, um, you know, a buffalo robe with uh, lines of blue beads on it, and we we could say, oh, that that looks like Agnes Martin, but oh, this is a thousand years old or something. Yeah. I mean, we did stuff like that, and we had to reteach ourselves, uh, you know, in a new vernacular, um, you know, culturally. 
And uh, we're still doing that. It's not that we cast out the European, uh, it's that we use both. Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I think, you know, art history is, is the is the key. If you're really looking at art history, Senefelder wasn't searching for the right tool or trying to follow some regulations and rules. Senefelder was experimenting, yeah. like Keith Howard, like Susan yeah. Rostow, yeah. and trying to figure out how to make something work with whatever was around. Right. Um, and to me, that's, that's the key, that right. we should be doing the same thing. Yeah. We should be... Uh, you know, yeah, creating with whatever we got. Yeah. What, whatever is available. What, yeah. Whatever tools we need for our time. Yeah. And yeah. so, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't, we would never yeah. poo poo uh, materials or, yeah. or methodology no. from the past, but yeah. I mean, we are learning how to do things safer. We see these little changes in the yeah. art world. Okay. One, okay. One change is with cadmium. Uh, cadmium is almost verboten now. You hardly ever see it. The other thing that we see is there isn't any lead in the white paint to make it opaque anymore. And the other thing that we're seeing is that in Crayolas, uh, you know, they disbanded flesh color. Why? Because we're BIPOC people and flesh color doesn't doesn't work for us anymore. Yeah. So, yeah. It's both so sides of the we have to, Yeah. yeah. We, we have to stay up with the times yeah. and, you know, be open to change. Yeah. As long as we get in trouble. Yes. <laughs> and I don't want to get in trouble. So, yeah. Um, uh, another question that we had um, is, are you familiar with kitchen lithography? Um, it's a beautiful process, um, possibly invented in France. Right. And I tried it a few times, but um, I'm a I'm a practical artist and I like to just, you know, get it done fast. Like uh, uh, the process of, of Keith Howard's image on that I was doing with... Um, Don Messick, where I would take, I would laminate a 30 by 40 plate, stick it in Don's inkjet printer, print my drawing on it, take it outside, expose it in the sun for 10 seconds, throw that thing in soda ash for uh, nine minutes, pull it out, spritz it with white vinegar to cure it, and then uh, ink it and print it. Like I could, I could make a 30 by 40 print in, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes, something like that, where, it, you know, that kitchen litho, it, you have to, it's a methodology and you really have to follow those rules. Otherwise the thing, it gets, it lifts and then it wrinkles and then it's stuck to the brayer. And then, and then you're using all those words that you can't use on the, on the radio. Yeah. And you know, when you, when during COVID, I remember you were teaching a, a printmaking class uh, at the Indian college in Santa Fe. And, um, Oh, and, I call it kitchen printmaking. Yeah. And so right. I was in my kitchen with yep. Zoom. Yes. <laughs> yeah. With my sink. Yes. And um, and I was like, uh, I was doing, uh, you know, yeah. uh, lino cut, wood cut, that, that sort of thing. And um, and we were, and I was mixing stuff. So w we made our own glue for Chine Calais. So mm -hmm. I would like, I get the wheat out and, you know, sift it and, you know, stuff like that. And, yeah. I mean, it was but, good, but. Yeah. And, and the students enjoyed it. And they followed along with him. And, uh, you know, we had to do things like that during COVID that yeah. weren't, uh, yeah, everybody, we all did. You, yeah. you you all did and we did too. But, you know, making art in your kitchen is yep. common. All yep. humans oh, yeah. know somebody or have done it themselves. In yep. fact, our good friend, printmaker, uh, uh, Joshua Orsborne, uh, has a litho press oh. in his kitchen. Oh, and he makes. I our wish prints. I could show you his his kitchen studio. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's so beautiful with the cooking pots over here, right. plants over here, and the inks over here. And he's got oh, this hundred year old beautiful. press, oh, big it's... cast iron. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, right. Was it yeah. Lang something? Yeah, anyway. it is. Yeah, a Lang. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a comment from someone at Kansas State University who mentioned that the professor of printmaking there, Jason Scuia, um, has developed electrolytes etching as non-toxic printmaking technique. Have you ever crossed paths with him? No, but that sounds no. really exciting. No, I think Jason wrote to me and um, he, when he was in the process of, he, the, yeah, he was like inventing this or researching it and wrote to me and asked if I would ever come over there, make a print with him. So yeah, no, I heard about that from him and um, I need to, I should follow up on that and, 
and uh, go back and see how it's working there because that's always intriguing to me when somebody's you know coming up with a new idea. You know, I want to know more about it. Playtime. Yeah. Oh, apparently Jason is organizing a print conference at Kansas State University in October. Ah, oh, okay. okay. Thank you for that news. Okay. Look, already here today, we've made new connections. This is great. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, uh, given the time um, and your generosity, I want to open, you know, is, is there one more question from the audience? Uh because if not, I wonder if it's um, if it's time to wrap up. Um, this has been absolutely incredible. Um, thank you so much, both Jean and Neil, for sharing this, your journeys. But also, it's incredible to hear you being kind of witnesses to a lot of these changes. And really, in, in many ways, through your work, encouraging more of those changes. Um, and hopefully, more and more people will learn about um, these um, these printmaking processes and these inks. Um, clearly, there's uh, there's a lot out there. Um, and thank you, thank you, thank you so much for sharing this information. Um, everyone's noting and clapping in the chat. Um, and we also want to thank um, Simon Levinson and Allison Wisher of the Drawing Foundation for helping us run this program. Um, and again, thank you so, so, so much. Um, we so appreciate um, and are so honored for this. Um, for yeah, this I say one last thing. Yes. You know, uh, yes. painting is generally, you know, a, a, an artist in isolation. Mm -hmm. um, even uh, sometimes is ceramics as well. Printmaking can be a community mm -hmm. art making experience. Experience, mm -hmm. and it brings we, us together. It brings us together, and like just like the artist like in today. Europe, uh, <laughs> who did it, you know, is a socialization in the evenings after they were in their isolation painting. And they would come together and, you know, and and make monotypes and the, and the museum's just like oh those aren't really art those are they were just playing around yeah that's kind of how they treat yeah. us right now and so uh we just want we just want everybody to know printmaking is is its own thing different and it brings people together in a community yeah. and that's one of the reasons that we love it so much it's community-based art yes it's community-based art Yes, you could, we, you, we could not have said this better. And that's exactly why we're here and why I think all of us in the audience, but also me and Cabell love printmaking so much. It's such a, it's its own, but it's such a wonderful collaborative um, communal um, medium and it right. inspires conversations like this. Yes, um, thank you. Thank yeah. you so, so much. Thank you for inviting us. It yep. was a great honor to be here today. Yeah, well, we're very thank honored. Everybody. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.